that sets the stage for the book of Exodus, the second of the traditional five books of Moses, what you might hear referred to as the Torah or the Pentateuch. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Genesis is everything that came before Moses. Exodus is his, his own story his own uh, experiences coming to earth, being called as a prophet, and leading the children of Israel, and then we're going to get to those final three books a little later on. So, with Exodus, what happens here is we begin in chapter 1 with Moses' own story, so he's no longer in abridging mode, writing down the things from previous prophets' writings, he's now telling his own story. And it begins, before he's even born here, with his family. Keep in mind, we've been in Egyptian bondage now for 400 plus years, and you'll, you'll see that in verse 6 of chapter 1, Joseph died, and all of his brethren, and all of that generation. So we begin the story going clear back to Joseph's time, he, he passes away, and then verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mightily, mighty, and the land was filled with them. This fulfills the, the promises God gave to Abraham back in Genesis 12. Doesn't make the Egyptians very happy that God's fulfilling his promises. Yeah, they don't love it. So they're, they're enslaved because this new king rose up in verse 8, which knew not Joseph. That's such an interesting biblical phrase, this new king which knew not Joseph, which means all of those privileges that were appointed to Joseph and all of his family, by extension, they're pulled back. And this new king in Egypt actually enslaves the people. It's interesting here, um, Biblical scholars and archaeologists have spent a lot of time looking at the ancient Middle East, and briefly what we discovered is there were a bunch of Semitic people, or Canaanites, who came down into Egypt and actually took over power and became the kings of Egypt. And it seems that Joseph actually gets into Egypt about this time and is appointed into a position of power with people who are ethnically and linguistically related to him. And from the archaeological record and the, and the literary record, these people who are called the Hyksos, it means foreign rulers, actually were overthrown by, uh, by Egyptians. And you can imagine Egyptians who have now overthrown the foreign rulers are saying, well, we didn't really like having foreigners running our country, and now all these foreigners who live in our country, we're going to find a way to put them to work. And that's kind of what maybe the historical context of the story where Moses is born into. Yeah, so we pick, we pick it up with uh, verse 11, therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pithom and Ramses. And these are cities that are built to Egyptian gods. Um, P, the word P in uh, Egyptian means house, and the Thomer actually means Atum, one of the creator gods of the Egyptian pantheon, and you have Ra. Here the Israelites are now having to build cities dedicated to the Egyptian gods, and I can just imagine, um, first of all, nobody likes to be enslaved, but to be enslaved to build temples to pagan deities that you don't worship probably doesn't make you feel very good. Mm. Then the story gives us an interesting little insight here in verse 12. It says, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. We've seen that in other places in Scripture, in church history, where sometimes the, the more pressure from the outside that gets put on a people, the stronger they become and the more resilient they end up becoming. It, it kind of has the opposite effect of the oppressors. Uh, so, the only reason I share that is because some of you right now in your life are probably feeling incredible amounts, untold levels of outside pressure and stresses and, and oppression weighing down upon you. I, I hope that for you verse 12 would be a little reminder that just because the external forces are really negative and they're heavy and they're not fun, doesn't mean that those internal forces can't multiply and that that spirituality and that connection with heaven can't actually be accelerated 
or increased or improved in ways that maybe you wouldn't get in, in other settings. I don't know. It may not apply to every situation out there, but it's something to a, a principle to at least consider. So look at this part now in verse 15, where we, where we get a new, a new paragraph marker in your King James Version. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other Pua. Normally in scripture you get uh, names mentioned when a really significant event is occurring, otherwise it would just be the midwives. But here the, you actually get two specific given names. And I'm here to tell you that in chapter 1 in this Moses story, these two women, Shifra and Pua, are some some of the unsung heroines. We, we know their name, but people don't usually go around giving talks about Shifra and Pua, and yet these two women did something in their sphere of influence at their time in their setting of life that was just as important or just as grand in the overall scheme of things as anything that anybody's ever done in other settings. What do I mean by that? They're commanded by the, the sovereign leader of the, the, the most powerful man in the world that they knew of. They were commanded to kill all of the Egyptian or all of the Hebrew boys that were born. These are midwives. So if it's a boy, let's, let's kill all of them because Pharaoh is so concerned that the numbers are just going to keep increasing. So what do you do? And he's also worried about those boys are, get older and become men who become military officers and they could then throw, create a coup and overthrow the Egyptians yeah. again. So what do you do when you're in this situation where you're being commanded to do something that you know is absolutely wrong on every level? Well, notice that verse 17 tells us, but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. I love the fact that when they had to make a decision between do I serve God or do I serve this really powerful person who's, who's commanding me to do something I really don't want to do, they chose to put God first and serve him. So it didn't take long for Pharaoh to realize that his plan wasn't working because he could see a whole bunch of Hebrew boys, little children running around. And so he calls in the midwives and asks them specifically, why, why haven't you obeyed me? And they say, well, verse 19, the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered uh, ere the midwives come in unto them. So, so we don't have a chance to, to carry out your orders. And then notice verse 21, it came to pass that because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. I think the Hebrew word there, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't mean that God gave them a whole bunch of mansions or physical houses. It's that he, he gave them households. He gave them increase. Uh, and their names are now revered down to this day. Uh, we know these two, and there were probably many others, but we as, at least specifically know these two. Well, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, houses also means dynasty. We get this in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where King David wants to build a house to the Lord, a temple. And God says through Nathan, actually, no, I'm going to build you a house. Now, David already had a palace, but God's saying, I'm going to make you a dynasty. And it's actually, it's not just about the dynasty, it's about having a named family where there's one name at the top that everybody says, I'm part of that family. And you notice you don't have the men who are likely married to these women mentioned. It's the women's names that are preserved here. In some ways, that's God had fulfilled the promise that I'm going to have you remembered as a memorial, your names, and we have, have their names now. So pr pretty amazing uh, way for God to fulfill his prophecy. So next time you, you hear the name Shifra and Pua, hopefully it, it can call to memory this idea of do what is right, let the consequence follow, put God first, let God prevail in your life and do the right thing. Now, we come into chapter 2, which is the, the 
introduction of Moses into the story. Everything before that is the fill those 400 plus years between Joseph and Moses' birth. That was chapter one.